Good afternoon and very warm welcome to everyone who's just joined us here for um, another one of our great masterclasses here at Working Options. Um, you may well be aware that Working Options is a charity that provides um, a career pathways program to support young people aged 14 to 19 um, with um, giving them opportunities to interact with employers and to raise awareness of different options and opportunities that are out there in, in the world of work and maybe just to give you an insight into various sectors that you would like more information on or more guidance um, and opportunities around. So today we are joined by um, a lovely group of colleagues from St. Pierre Group, um, and they will be speaking to you today. Uh, the recording session, I'm sorry, the, the session will be recorded, and that recording of the session will be available afterwards as well. Um, you can get that from the Working Options website, and also it will be sent out um, to anyone who's registered for the session, so you can look back in your own time. Um, it's a great opportunity this afternoon to pick the brains of the experts here with us today. Um, so please make sure any questions that you have, you pop in the chat facility and Liz and her colleagues will pick those up and share their thoughts um, with you. It's also a great opportunity to really look into a sector um, and look at those different pathways, different routes um, that are available. And hopefully it may be something that you can uh, consider taking further and Liz and her colleagues will be more than happy to be contacted um, afterwards as well with any questions. So I'm going to hand over to Liz. She's going to introduce her team. And then, as I say, if you do have any questions, please make sure you use the chat facility and we'll get as much out of our colleagues as we can um, in the next half an hour to an hour. So thank you very much, Liz. Over to you and St. Pierre Group. Thanks, Claire. Um, hello, we are a selection of colleagues from Saint Pierre Group. So I'm going to give you a little introduction to what the business is, um, how we operate, and what's different about us. And then I'll introduce you to a couple of people from various different departments uh, across the business. So Saint Pierre Group is unique in that we uh, represent bakery brands. Um, so we don't actually have production facilities on site. Um, but we do develop products. We are responsible for shipping them across the globe. We are responsible for making sure that they end up on supermarket shelves, um, again, globally. Um, and we're responsible for marketing them and building those brands. So we look after St. Pierre, which is our flagship brand. Uh, it is a leader in brioche products. We are the number one brioche brand in the UK. We are the number one brioche brand in America. Um, we also have Baker Street and Paul Hollywood, um, who has a range of ready to bake products. Um, we turned over in excess of £100 million pounds for the past two years running. We've broken that barrier. Um, we're based out of Didsbury in Manchester, which again makes us quite unique. We've got uh, just over 90 colleagues um, and we've also got offices in Cincinnati. Find us dotted around everywhere selling our selling our products in. Um, the first person that I'm going to introduce you to is Kasha. Kasha Hi. works in NPD, so she's going to tell you a little bit about um, products from uh, coming up with the idea to actually seeing them on shelf at supermarkets. Hi guys, uh, my name is Kasha, and I am working in a new product development department. In a short, is NPD. And to be honest, I get to this department really by mistake because my um, my background it was a master of degree in a tourism resources and law, uh, and I came over to UK in 2010. I didn't really speak English, which my career in the UK was a bit like starts very crazy from the kind of warehouse job, but. First day when I walk in there, I was like, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> and in 2016, I just came like by mistake across new product development, uh, which uh, before I never even thought that such a department is exist. Um, and to be honest, everything happened for a reason and I am in a career now what I really love. That's a very excited job. Uh, basically what we do in a, NPD department, we just brought the product from the concept to launch. 
And that's on the slide, you can see our stage plan. Uh, it's not as simple as you could see uh, that is just appear on the shelf. It's a lot of work going into that. It's a lot of departments involved. And uh, how it starts, we get the product from our bakeries and then uh, we do like an investigation. We just check if it's right for our market, our customer, our brand. And if everybody is happy, we just put the yeah, thumbs up and then it goes to the stage one. That's like an investigation. We're still not spending money in this stage, but we're just uh, working with the bakeries. They send us the samples to us. Uh, if they're not right, we just give a feedback to the bakeries. Um, and we're working very close with our bakeries. Sand Pier is a slightly different type of business because, as Liz mentioned before, we not manufacture in the UK, which any person who is foodie, who has a lot of idea and a lot loads of travel, the Sand Pier is for them because obviously we have to visit our bakeries in Europe quite a lot. Uh, and once the product is right for us and uh, it, it's safe. We obviously check our micro. Uh, we send for a loads of tests, which is also a little bit of technical side is involved in NPD. Then we sign this as a priority project. That's the stage when the we start bring all the department and we start work uh, on the artwork. We start branded the product. We start sent for loads of tests. We spend loads of money, and also we involved the commercial team and this is where they presented they they check if the price and everything it's working when it's working we go to lunch hey ho it's very close then it's a first production we produce the the, the product and um after this we launch and it's a hit the shelves obviously it's a much more things involved on the way but uh, that's like a very briefly what npt does but also we have a um, more excited side of this department too, like as a Saint Pierre is a really branded company. We do a lot of ideas for a different brand. And on the next slide, you could see we come up with the, some ideas for a marketing team. And this is the ideas for our Saint Pierre uh, brand. And the marketing team just brought this to life as a, like a beautiful photo shoot. We've got a food stylist uh, who works for us. Uh, which is uh, very excited and uh, like here we can see some uh, Christmas winter recipes. Um, just keep eye on the uh, trends on the market to just bring uh, like uh, loads of good flavors. And also we have a Baker Street brand, which is going to be on the next slide. Uh, we also working very close with this brand and then uh, bring uh, all the recipes to life. Uh, we close, uh, we work very close with the marketing team. Uh, and also we work with the Paul Hollywood brand and this is also our like a winter new recipes. Uh, and it just like a recap what we're doing in the NPD. It's a basically we bring the product from the very, very concept to just appear on the shelves in the stores. And it's a very good feeling when you actually see the product on the shelf and you think, oh my God, I did it. It's actually hit the shelf. It's like really, really good feeling. And uh, yeah, I, I never ever told that I will be working for a new product um, development department, but I'm so glad that I, I'm here. I'm working for a great company and I probably would never ever change this. But it's just only to let you know that sometimes you don't know straight away what you actually want to do, but everything happens for a reason and it's still a chance to change and be in a great place. Thank you. Oh, no, I, yeah, I passed to Matt, our supply chain colleague. <laughs> um, so I think Cassie will be able to tell you that I'm probably in the wrong, wrong role and that I should probably be working with her <laughs> considering how often I am over with recipes and ideas. Yeah, definitely. Matt is um, a very pretty person. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to cover supply chain, uh, and in terms of my background, I'm going to focus on the three main branches of our supply chain. 
and there are others that do encompass customer services and procurement as well but i'll focus on the three mainly because i've had roles within all three at one point or another um so beyond uh, achieving a physics degree i did work in retail so very much on the ground up um again within a store of pets at home before moving into an office role for them uh, I dabbled within logistics as well, which to be honest was not always a favourite, but planning, forecasting, um, very numbers and planning based has always been my side. So uh, working for some more familiar names such as NNS and some other manufacturers that might not manufacture food, um, but the concept is very much the same anyway. Um, so within supply planning ourselves, we do have um, three main pivots. Uh, that is the forecasting role. Uh, in order to get stock on shelves, you need to have a plan and that plan does involve knowing your figures and understanding your figures and understanding where things do go wrong. And within forecasting, you're having to validate a lot of data. You have to be very numbers driven. Um, at, and a lot of this information you are feeding back to other teams uh, within the business and you are working very closely with sales and commercials how much are you going to sell um are, are those finance who are using those figures to put a pound sign on them um my day-to-day -day role does sit within planning so I produce orders for the whole of the business for the UK uh, and it is a highly coordinated role because you are sitting between uh, both for forecasting and logistics so you're getting a plan from forecasting and you're actioning that and you're uh, ensuring that logistics are seeing that through so that stuff that you are ordering is going where you want it to go and when you want it to go there uh, especially in a food retail business as well, you do have a very finite life on product. If you have too little, you're not going to make enough money. And if you have too much, you're going to uh, not be able to sell it. Um, and again, you you sit in a very central role in terms of you will be working with customer services um, who sits with you in the actual your sales and commercial and also your procurement as well so your procurement will be um your go between between yourselves and the bakeries um and you can find that you, you may have finite capacity within a bakery a bakery um can produce as much as you want but you need to understand your needs need to be understood um by the bakery itself and Finally, in terms of logistics, so everything, everything can be forecast, everything can be planned out, but actually getting our stock, uh, and in terms of uh, this business, this is mainly from Europe, so this is intercontinental um, movement, so this is uh, sea freight, road freight, occasionally rail freight as well, um, and within logistics as well well we warehouse within the UK um, and that all needs to be managed managed every movement from the bakery to ourselves and from ourselves to the customer we manage the logistics team um, and even within the last few years you can find that that can become a very more diverse more complex side of the business as well as well as as soon as the business grows um, and again, planning with the logistics, you, you can tend to find there are a lot of issues uh, and it is usually planning logistics that tend to uh, be the ones that have to problem solve and find a solution to these um, issues, mainly in availability of stock to customers. Uh, so in terms of forecasting, day to day, uh, the roles of a forecaster are it is sales analysis. Are you selling as much as you say you will? Are you selling over or under? And do any problems occur from that, as we have previously mentioned? Um, and again, accuracy reporting. So it's telling you how uh, 
good is your data? How reliable is your data? Uh, and at present, we have one person working on forecast in the business. And for someone to sit in a room within that, they have to be very data driven, very numbers driven. Uh, and that's really central to it. But beyond that, you also need to be able to be a good forecaster, to be able to story tell uh, and to get answers from your data and be able to really drive that home and almost influence people. Um, uh, so within planning as well, um, you, as, as we've already mentioned, you do sit in the middle of a lot of people, so you are you have to be very diplomatic. Um, you have to be a problem solver. <laughs> you are um, piecing together a jigsaw um, of many pieces. You do have to be highly organised and you also need to be able to manage a lot of tasks and a lot of uh, moving parts on one go. Um, and this isn't always done by a single person, so there can be a main planner, uh, but there are also coordination roles as well that almost sit to manage the diplomacy, if you're following <laughs> um, the theme between teams. So we do have a coordinator that sits between planning and logistics to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Um, and that can definitely improve um, any issues between the two teams as well. And in terms of logistics as well, as we've previously mentioned, um, logistics is another role where you need to be highly organised. Uh, you need to be a good communicator, especially when um, you're speaking to people whose English may not be the native tongue, um, and be able to negotiate as well. Um, again, in a world where freight prices are very erratic, that do increase, um, getting the best price is always um, beneficial to any business. Uh, and with the sheer volume of transport and forever increasing, that, that is important. And that means that the person doing that role has to be um, as organised as possible um, because missing transport, um, missing dates can be highly effective towards highly well, an issue to the company. And that's me. Uh, hi, um, my name's Cameron. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the commercial and sales side of the business. Um, first of all, I'll just give you a little bit of a, an overview of myself. Um, so my current role is commercial assistant, although I did start off as a data and an, an, an analyst within the company. <laughs> Um, swiftly made a change three months later once another position became available. Um, my key interests are football, rugby, golf. I enjoy going to the cinema and I also enjoy socialising whilst listening to podcasts and things as well. I'm trying to play a little bit more golf at the moment, but the weather is not really helping that just now. Um, they have a saying within the company that when everyone joins, uh, you put on the St. Pierre stone, as they call it, because we have a lot of nice <laughs> products that taste very good, but are not necessarily very good for the waistline if, if, uh, if eating in too much quantity. Um, my previous work experience, so I've, I've had a variety of roles. Um, I'm only 22, so I'm very much still early in my career. Um, I initially began out as a football coach, doing summers, part-time work. Similarly with being a barman as well, my local pub, thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, did another summer being a labourer and then moved into maybe the more um, sort of businessy role that I'm sort of in now. I was a sales intern um, over in the Netherlands for a couple of weeks. Um, and then I also have been a marketing intern, which was last summer at McAllen Whiskey. So sort of similar to the theme just now with the food and drinks industry. That was what initially sort of got my interest and really caught my gauge as an industry that I want to be in was the time that I spent at McAllen Whiskey because I enjoy going out to restaurants and to pubs, socialising. So being in an industry which has a, a tangible product that you can see and you can show your friends is something that I really, I really like about being in this in this type of business at Saint Pierre Group. Um, I'll give you three facts about myself because when commercial and sales is important that 
your customers and your clients know a lot of information about you, but also that you know information about them too. Um, so I recently moved down from Scotland, and um, if you can't tell by the accent, I lived there for 21 years and I'm adjusting to life in England at the moment, although it's not too dissimilar to be honest. I just get a few, I just get a few, a, few, a bit of slagging off for being from Scotland, but it's all it's all fun and games. Um, I have a black Labrador called Max. He's living back home at my family house. And my favourite Saint Pierre product is our brioche tear and share, which you, if you haven't had an opportunity to try, I would thoroughly recommend. Um, move on to the next one. Um, so you've already heard from Kasha about the new product development, and we've also heard from Matt about the logistics side of things. Um, really, as a commercial and sales, what our responsibility is to do is to make sure that our fabulous product, which you've already heard about, get into our customers' hands, um, and also through the logistics. Product that we have into the customer's hands, but also then getting it into the consumer's hands. Um, so there's several responsibilities that we have within the commercial team that can ensure this to happen. Um, negotiating is a big is a big side of it. Um, and that's not to be mistaken for arguing. Negotiating is, is something a little bit different where you're working with clients and you're working with customers to try and find solutions to problems. Um, so that could potentially be pricing issues. Um, it could also be issues to do with when stock's going to be coming into their warehouse, be going into the shop. And um, if there's going to be issues, it's about maybe trying to mitigate them and to have at least impactful way on how their customers are going to be able to buy the product. Um, another aspect is communicating. So you've got internal communication, which is really vital throughout the commercial and sales team. Um, communication is quite key in terms of being able to understand if there's going to be any challenges coming up in the future from other teams. Um, from supply chain um, and then there's also communication is quite key when you're looking at marketing so that's another department that commercial and sales work closely alongside but how can we best market the product that we have in our different customers whether that be Tesco, Asda, the smaller stores to make sure that the consumers that are walking into shops are able to see our product and that St. Pierre stands out. We also have to do a lot of analysis as well and um, whether that be competitor analysis or some of our main competitors are our Warburton's, Roberts. So we have a lot of other people that we have to make note of in the market as well. What are they up to? How much are their products going for just now? What are they doing that maybe we're not? Where can we learn from them? What are customers and say, we're growing better here. Our sales are better here. So analyzing the market and our competitors is really important. Um, and also keeping an app sort of an eye on the price that our, our products are currently in shops for as well and because that can have a massive influence on on how much product that we're selling because if our products may be being sold for for too for too high a price then people aren't going to be maybe prepared to pay for that and so that's something that we've got to consider and analyze and make sure that we're aware of all the time um, and finally sorry sam i can't see that last one does that say <laughs> it's just in the way networking. yeah networking so that's another big um, a big aspect of being in the commercial and sales team. Um, we're the, the face a lot of the time of the business when dealing with customers. Um, so a lot of the time networking can involve to going with new product launches. So we had a bagel event recently where lots of customers came. So we get an opportunity to speak to them, get feedback. Networking also involves going to conferences. Um, so a lot of the time, a lot of the big retailers will have conferences where they learn throughout the year. What they're going to be looking for in future plans in terms of promotional activity what help they would like where where what parts of their their shops are doing well at the moment and where we can step in and maybe help them to to up their sales and um, so networking is, is a big part of, of being in a commercial and sales team so if you're quite outgoing and um, if you like socializing but also if you like speaking about business as well and learning from other people then in the commercial and sales role is quite a good a good place for you to be uh, I'll now go into a little bit about my responsibilities. So that was just a quick overview of the responsibilities of commercial sales as a whole. Specifically, I'm, a, I'm an assistant. So we have national account managers that look after all the accounts that we have. And my role is making sure that I can assist those account managers in best, as best as I possibly can so that they have all the information that they need when speaking to our customers. Um, so I deal with a lot of inquiries. So we get people that come in and um, email us. They phone us asking, where can we buy your product? How much is your product? Um, do your product prices vary? Whether I buy it in a Morrison's, whether I buy it in a Tesco's. And one of my main roles is, is assisting these 
these customers, um, consumers and customers, as to where is best to get our product, where they're geographically located and where we can get the best delivery to them in the least amount of time. Um, meeting preparation, so very much like this meeting, um, a lot of my responsibility is um, preparing presentations, gathering data that might be needed for the presentations, key facts, key figures, um, and also just being there present in the meetings, taking notes so that once we leave, we have key actions to take away. I'm in charge of samples too. Um, so I send out a lot of samples to people that are interested in trying our products, um, whether that be pubs, whether that be restaurants, uh, maybe wholesalers that are looking to stock our products. Um, so I spend quite a lot of time in the sample room um, and making sure that we have enough samples so that when people come and ask for products, we can send out to them as quickly as possible. Promotional planning is another aspect of the business that, that I'm involved in. Um, so when you see in the shop that a product might be available for £1.99 when it's usually available for £2.50, um, those things aren't, aren't just, they don't just happen. They, it's all put together meticulously in a plan to look at maybe weather conditions. We would sell a lot of burger buns where so barbecue range is popular at that time. Kids going back to school, we have a lot of crepes, brioche. So there's a lot of planning that goes into a lot of the stuff that you see in store. Um, so I help in putting together that plan in terms of when we're going to be promoting things. Um, and there's claims and invoices as well. For me, that's probably the side of the business which is least um, least favourable for me. That's a lot of the admin stuff. Um, so it's dealing with a lot of price discrepancies where we might have invoiced for the wrong amount or the customer might have invoiced us for the wrong amount. So that's a lot of the admin tasks that I complete, but also free up my national account manager, Mark's time so that he can spend more time in finding where we're going to um, get new customers and get our products into more places. So a lot of my responsibility as a commercial assistant is to make my national account manager job as easy as possible and to take a lot of the tasks that he might find time consuming and challenging and allow him to focus on the things that are most important. Just put together a little list here for you. So if some of you have been in any of these stores, you might have seen our products. And um, we have Tesco, Co-op, Asda, Morrison's, sort of as uh, the main the main retailers that we supply into. We also do wholesale as well. So a lot of your local corner shops will go to Booker Wholesale. You can see they're in the blue best way and they'll purchase our products through there and then put them into their smaller stores. Um, you've also got Deliveroo as well. You've got Waitrose. Um, so if, you're, if you are out and about or you have, have been in, in any of these shops recently or are going to be in the future, um, keep an eye out for our products because there's a lot of work that's gone on through all the team and the commercial and sales team um, that, have, that have ended up in getting these products into these, into these places. So that's sort of my, my part on commercial and sales over. So I'll now pass you over to Sam. Um, she's going to talk to you a little bit about the marketing side of the business. It's also worth just noting that that's, that's a lot of customers on that slide and that's yeah. just UK. Um, so there's a whole portion of the business that operates in the US. So um, the slide would look even busier if we yeah. were to put all of our customers on there. Fab. Okay, so um, my name's Sam. Uh, I'm the Digital and Social Media Marketing Manager here at St. Pierre Group. Uh, and I'm going to chat to you a little bit about marketing in general, and then specifically what myself and my team does within social media and digital. So a little bit about my background. So I'm actually a trained journalist. Um, I studied journalism and media studies at university in De Montfort in Leicester. Um, when I left university, I actually went into a, a job in PR. Um, so similar to kind of what Liz does now, um, was very much on the kind of B2B side. So trade mainly, um, talking about not very sexy things like brioche. Uh, it was very much, uh, unfortunately, clients around paving fences and having to write features and news stories about them to kind of get them out there and seen within the market. Um, I decided to go back into journalism and actually moved to London from Birmingham, um, where I worked in various different business publications. So one of them was on the left in that photo, uh, a title called Event Magazine, all about the events industry. I was very lucky enough to go to very, lots of lovely events, uh, including Eurovision in Copenhagen, which was a few years ago. Um, I actually ended up um, working at Sky News as well, so very much different from print journalism, uh, broadcast journalism and breaking news, 
but worked on the social media side um, for that role. Um, was again very fortunate enough to uh, launch a TV show on social media whilst I was there. Meet some uh, celebrities um, as you do. So uh, the top picture in the right hand corner is actually, uh, I don't know if you know Daryl from The Walking Dead, but uh, we did an interview with him and we got to interview him on the social media side as part of that. Um, um, how did I get into social media and digital? So within my first job um, as a PR exec, I was asked to look at what a Twitter hashtag was and what the at symbol meant on Twitter. Um, so at very early days of social media, no one really knew what was going on, what to do, how to do things. It's probably still the same, same case now, uh, but just with a lot more channels. But um, that's how I literally got into social media. Um, and from there, uh, just built up my experience um, with lots of different channels and lo lots of different types of content. Uh, I've worked in different social media agencies and in-house roles over the last 15 years. Uh, and, and now I'm at San Pierre Group. Um, my role is very much looking after our almost 20 social media channels uh, for our brands and the corporate side. Uh, we have about eight websites that we manage as well for both consumers, for business. Uh, and we've started doing lots of nice new different digital marketing things to share. Uh, we've launched our first e-newsletter for San Pierre USA, which is fantastic. Uh, and we've got lots of exciting things to come in 2023. Um, so our marketing department consists of 16 people. Um, we have all got lots of different types of roles. So uh, we have lots of different teams here within marketing. And to kind of give you a bit of a brief overview, uh, I've broken it down into our little teams. So we have our brand marketing teams. They're very much the kind of the brand champions. They're the kind of, they head up everything from what the brand says, does look like on shelf, in store, online, um, you name it. They're kind of championing the brand as much as possible. Um, and they work closely with our other teams uh, like commercial, NPD, et cetera, to make sure things like new products, packaging, promotions, et cetera, uh, are all happening for the brand and being marketed in the right way. Um, we have an insights team. Um, uh, it's actually a, a team of one, <laughs> so very small insights team. Uh, but uh, their job is to basically research and share insights around our brand uh, and their competitors, uh, the products we're producing and opportunities for, for new products that we might be able to look at launching, uh, what our consumers uh, are, who, who are our shoppers, what, uh, what are they doing, what are they like, um, and also uh, just generally anything around international markets as well to kind of help improve on our kind of marketing efforts. Um, so that gives you a bit more in, of an insight into that department. Uh, PR and comms, which is Liz's bread and butter. Um, she is there to help get people um, aware of the brand and the products. Oh, are we still? Can you see the presentation still? Perfect. Um, so um, she's very much there to get people talking about our brands and products in various different ways. So uh, whether that's breaking news stories to uh, online and websites and magazines, newspapers and events, uh, you name it, she's doing it basically. So uh, her job is very broad uh, and goes way beyond that remit anyway. Um, activation. So uh, they're very much about showcasing our brands and our products in numerous different places, predominantly in store, uh, and that's both in store and on the retailers' websites, um, as well as at events, both on the trade side, so exhibitions to consumer events. So one that Cameron mentioned earlier, we did a sort of a nice consumer event called the Burgle Bar um, for San Pierre UK, which we hosted at Almost Famous in Manchester. So we've actually put a couple of photos there on the screen uh, so that you can see. Um, and then social and digital, which is my remit. So we're very much the voice of the brand on social media, websites, email, uh, and, and lots more in between, which I'm actually going to chat to you about now. Um, so um, social and digital is very, very varied. Um, it's, it's great in the sense of being able to adapt to different channels and um, no day is the same, no piece of content is the same, which is really exciting. So um, 
some key points around what we do. So we create content for lots of different social channels, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest. One of the areas of our uh, work is that we create lots of wonderful exciting content to promote the products and how to use them so anything from recipe how-to videos to jumping on the hottest food trend um, we host competitions we work with other brands to showcase ways our products could work with their products as well so one example of that is the first video which is actually the whole butterboard trend so we've jumped on this quite a lot over the last sort of couple of months and created various different numerations of butterboards uh, and how Saint Pierre brioche can fit in with them. Um, we also work with influencers and celebrities to promote our products um, internationally. So the second video, uh, you can see a guy holding up some burgers looking very happy. Um, this is actually an American chef called Richard Blaze. Um, he's wonderful. He, he's a judge on a, a TV show over there with Gordon Ramsay. Um, we actually did a paid promotion with him to create some grilling recipes for over the summer. Uh, and he actually did a, a really nice, uh, fun, entertaining video with his big green egg barbecue, creating a mega burger recipe. Um, we also do social advertising um, to help get a bit more exposure of our brands and products out there. Uh, and the main aim of that is to point people to where our products are available. So find our brioche burgers in Tesco or get your uh, brioche bagels at uh, Sainsbury's, let's say. Um, and the, the reason that we do that is to help contribute to generating more sales for the business. Uh, we also do a lot of digital activity. So we create lots of wonderful interactive user-friendly websites. So the picture on the right-hand side is actually our Saint Pierre website. Uh, and we try and make sure these websites are kind of like our go-to home for inspiration, info about the brand, where you can buy our products, etc. cetera. Um, so it has lots of inspiration and ideas for recipes and content on there. Um, we also do um, lots of other things in between the fun stuff, which uh, sort of adding to what Cameron said can be a little bit boring at times, but depending on what you do and don't like, uh, you might not find it that boring. So things like analytics and reporting is really important to make sure we know what's working on our channels and what isn't and how we can improve. Uh, we do something called community management, which is responding to direct messages and comments on social media, um, emails through our inquiries inbox. Um, and there's lots more elements to our role, which I wish I could tell you, uh, but I think I would go over time and uh, Liz would kill me. So um, <laughs> if you have any follow up questions, you can let us know. Bloody because murder isn't actually in my job description, but everybody <laughs> seems to think I'm capable nonetheless. Um, I hope that was really helpful for everybody. there are in in our business um, we are a very diverse group of 90 people and um, all from different backgrounds different routes um, as to how we got in the jobs that we've got um, so I, th I think there's some questions that have come through but um, any more that have occurred to you just pop them in the chat um, the first one I think is coming for you Matt uh, <laughs> it says how do you know what people want like how much to bake um, are you just guessing and how do you not end up with lots of brioche left over? Um, well, <laughs> I, I, I can say I've been here a year and the company's been here a lot longer. Um, so we do look at yearly trends, but this is more of a commercial um, question. Um, it can come down, especially one of the hardest products to cast in for will always be a new product. Um, especially if it's something that is completely different to anything that's on the market. Now, if you're looking at, uh, for example, a loaf of bread, um, and you, you, can, you can look at a, if a, a new customer's listing it, um, it will be how many stores is it going into, what do they expect to sell in a week, and you almost wrap that up into a total figure. Uh, and that's usually worked through with uh, the forecaster and the uh, commercial team and some of the stuff that uh, Cam picked up on in terms of talking about price points. Uh, there can be things that can 
uh, improve or increase forecast and also the cash rent. So it's sorry, there's a higher price, you more likely to sell less. But there is usually uh, almost a uh, plan, almost like a skeleton of uh, if it's a burger bun product, then this is almost the path it would take in terms of its natural. And rate of establishment in terms of sales, they do tend to come, but it's always the challenge of the first six to eight weeks, or is the most difficult is the product itself finds its feet, but um, it's more difficult for newer products rather than established products. You are following previous trends uh, and just taking a lot of what we've just said um, in terms of things that can alter how it's usually gone previously. I think oh, I was just going to say, I think knowing what people want is something that this business does really well because of the mix of, of departments that we've got that feed into it. So Sam mentioned we've got um, an insights manager on the marketing team. So they are identifying trends all the time. What are people, what are consumers wanting? We invest a lot of money in polling consumer audiences to understand um what they make of the brand what would they expect to see from the brand are we living up to the quality um in terms of our products which is vitally important because we are um a business that is built on brands so protecting the brand quality is is paramount to to our success um that is then mixed with all of the trends work that uh, Kasha and Lindsay do in MPD. Um, we've also got category insights. So from the commercial team, there's a, there's a category department within commercial and um, that look at what's what's selling. So um, has a competitor just launched um, a product that has transformed a subsector. So uh, a couple of the guys mentioned the brioche bagel. That's probably our most recent launch in the UK. And that was born of the fact that bagels as a sector is, is massively in growth. And we don't have a bagel product, but we're the number one brioche brand. So what better idea? Um, consumers obviously want bagels. They're interested in new products coming out of bagels because they're flying off the shelves. Um, and they're also interested in brioche because we're selling a lot of brioche. So let's combine the two. And so far, so good. It's been a really successful launch. So um, there's lots of different answers to how do you know what people want, but predominantly it's by using all of our departments to work together um, and, and actually find out what, what people want and then see if we can deliver it in a way that you know makes us money. Um, <laughs> Did you want to add? Yeah, no, I was just going to say that we can get, we can, we always look at the type of information that, that um, Matt and Liz just talked, spoke about there. Um, but a lot of the time, we're not always going to get it right as well. So that's something that you have to also what? consider. <laughs> um, some of our products, for example, that are particularly popular in the summer um, are dependent a lot of the time on the weather. So if we forecast that um, we think our burger buns are going to do particularly well and then we get two or three weeks of rain, then that could have a lot of impact on the amount of people that are going to have barbecues. Um, so we're going to have some stock that's left over. Um, so then that's our role as a commercial team to maybe try and find alternative ways that we could we could get that stock out to customers, whether we could offer it at a discounted rate um, because it's having a lower shelf life on it, whether we try and find new customers that maybe don't take our product and we could give it to them at a discounted rate. Or we could even give it to them for free as well. There's some shops that haven't tried some of our products um, and then they put it in their stores. And then if it works out really well, then it's a repeat purchase that they might want to make. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we can do if if we, we think we've slightly got the numbers wrong in terms of how much we're going to sell. Um, but ultimately, we always seem to most of the time find a way to make sure that it, it works. Yeah. And, it, and if we do make too much, we also, you know, that's when communication is key because um, all the teams can let marketing know and then we can find opportunities to sample it at various events through summer, um, of which there are always lots. Yeah. Um, we might donate stuff to charity, um, both in the UK and in the US. So we'll always find a home. Yeah. <laughs> we'll find a home for the brioche. Um, what makes your brand better? Or stand out more than competitors. Oh, where do you start? <laughs> <laughs> um, We're orange. <laughs> we, got, we got on on shelf Sunday. I think um, I touched on it briefly when I said that as as a business that is. Uh, we're predominantly about branding products and making sure that we sell them. Um, 
the heart of that is ensuring that we're giving the best product it's it's about quality so um, we do regular hall tests or independent taste tests both in the uk and the us to make sure that in terms of taste texture appearance we're offering the best products on the market um, that's part of how we get the title of number one brioche brand in the uk and the us and then we combine that obviously with the sales figures um, and and the brand the brand marketing so um, we are always making sure that we're positioning the brand uh, in a way that communicates the quality of the product. Um, so we can be confident in, in making those claims. So what makes us stand out is, is a lot of different things. Um, yeah, this probably backing up what we say. Yeah, and I think um, probably across the board within various different departments as well, there's always like innovation there to help drive kind of, I suppose, making us stand out and be better than our competitors so if our competitors are producing as with brand marketing really you know where they might be doing certain things but they might have missed an opportunity to say work with a certain other brand to pr help promote our products or um you know like how i was mentioning earlier with like influencers and celebrities and different tactics like that where again, like, you know, our direct competitors might be missing a bit of a trick. We're always looking to sort of jump on that to sort of make ourselves stand out so that we're not just sort of following the same path as other brands like La Boulanger, Brioche Pasquier, et cetera, so. And from the NPD point of view, because we have uh, so many bakeries in Europe, always we can look for a product. We're not only restricted to the one manufacturer. It's for, for example, if you have the factories in the UK, they have a, some kind of equipment and to produce something new they have to invest loads of money we can find a new bakery who will basically do this for us obviously on this way we need to find that the quality is right for our brand but it gives us like this big opportunity for different products um can one of the other questions can you start in marketing for example then move to sales uh short answer is yes um, we've got lots of examples within the business already where people have started in in one that camera <laughs> started in one role and moved to another. Um, it, the business generally is quite open to that. I think if you're if it becomes clear that you're better suited to other roles when they become available, um, the business will always be open to you moving into those. I think uh, Jade, who is now. Um, uh, it, she's in commercial yeah. um, on the UK side, but she started in finance um, and went, no, <laughs> this isn't for me. Um, she needs to be in front of customers. Um, and most of the marketing department have had sales training as well. They, they go on the sales training with the, with the commercial team. So uh, in short, yes, you could. <laughs> um, are there any hands-on roles, nice pun, uh, in the bakery sector or is work mostly done by machines? I'm going to throw this one out to Kasha. Yeah, we have a different types of the bakeries. Mostly they are fully automated, which it's not many people in a factory. Um, it's a, even the product is the pick up by machines put on the line it goes through the, like a flow pack and they even machine pick them put them in a cases case are managed by the robots uh, but we have a, like a couple of bakeries where it's still it's a, like a lot of people involved online because the product is packed by hand it's a really depends on the product but it's a i would say it's a mix um, what type and what types of work experience would help students if they wanted to work for you? Um, Probably depends by department, really, doesn't yeah. it? Because I think with marketing, it's very much sort of we have so many different elements of marketing that you know PR isn't the same as activation and it's not the same as social media and digital. But I think with that, you know, exposure at you know brands, especially with the FMCG sector. Um, is massively beneficial just to learn more about the industry, how it works about marketing a food or drinks brand within that uh, definitely is beneficial from our side. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say that that is um, trying to get industry experience can be really valuable. Um, I touched on a little bit there some of the roles that I had as well before I before I'd even left left school as, as a barman, as a football coach. You can pick up a lot of 
a lot of skills that can be transferable to your type of role when you when you are quite young as well. Um, as a barman, you have to speak to a lot of different people um, outside your comfort zone, interact with them all the time, similar to a lot of the networking that I do now. So you'll find that although there are there are industry specific roles and experiences that getting getting a position at Saint Pierre, also a lot of a lot of the roles and responsibilities that some of you might have now or even maybe pick up in the future that aren't directly related to kind of transferable skills that will work to your benefit when you come to apply for jobs. And I think the only variation in terms of supply chain is um, that life um, of the products. You can find a lot of, uh, especially manufacturing in the UK, uh, could be things like pharmaceuticals and um, cosmetics, which tend to have a uh, long to almost um, not required um, <laughs> the word. I'm just a complete. <laughs> yeah, they're less likely to have a best before. Yeah, day. all the best you before days, three or four years. To yeah. say you're doing something with that could have as little as five weeks' life is um, the key. So if you're looking at food and bakery, you're looking at something that that's applicable for in terms of best before dates. But supply chain logistics. Um, there is only this the small <laughs> um, between uh, the food sector and say supply chain logistics of um, any other non yeah. Yeah. sectors getting there. For me, it was a quite a funny one because what helps me uh, actually to come to the Saint Pierre, I obviously I had a little bit experience as an MPD assistant in a previous uh, jobs, but actually my parents they had a bakery when I was a little, which I was actually growing up in a bakery and I know the process, I know how to make the bread, and during my interview I actually didn't think about this, which is, was like. And then by the question which people was asking me on the interview, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know how to make a bread. I was growing up in a bakery and they was like, really? <laughs> Why you didn't say that? Which sometimes it's a little things like from our past, which actually could help us to, to, to get the job. It doesn't need to be like a such an experience, but it's a, just a, you need to just think and. Yeah, I'd agree with what that. What could help you? Yeah, I, I used to write for a publication called British Baker magazine. So again, like during the interview process, I was like, well, this is hopefully going to massively help me, you know, sort of showcase I do have that bakery industry knowledge. So I would say if you are applying for, for something within a sector like that, make sure you kind of look back at your experience or look back at your skills and see, like, even if it's not directly, you know, like bakery for a bakery company, could work within that company, what they're looking for, what you can offer. And one of the other questions is, do you have or do you do apprenticeships? We do. We don't have like a, a formalised, I guess, apprenticeship scheme, but we do have examples within the business of people who joined on an apprenticeship and now have full time roles. And um, so uh, Vinny is an example of that who came in on a on a business, I think, finance and business apprenticeship and is now um I can't remember his actual job IT, title. IT. But he, yeah, he's in an IT, IT operations. IT and operations. Mm -hmm. um, so he kind of came in. <laughs> <laughs> he's come in in one role and, and slightly moved as he's, as he's, I think he's been with the business for about two years. So he's gone through a couple of different um, transitions of that, but started with an apprenticeship and is now a full-time role. Um, and uh, Joe was here on an apprenticeship. Yeah. Um, and he's actually working through he's doing three month placements in each of the departments so that he can work out you know wh where is it that he that uh, i'm pretty sure he's angling for a role on the us team uh, because we <laughs> we do get to travel we are very lucky um i landed back from america yesterday after uh, two weeks in the states um so it, it is a fantastic place to work and there's loads of opportunity for people to to learn and to move around different departments and work out what you know where are they going to excel um one of the other questions that's come through is where do young people go to find out about the opportunities or job roles that we have available probably be our linkedin page for san pierre group when they're available so anytime that we have a live job ad it will go onto the san pierre group linkedin page so i definitely say Follow us on there, um, keep an eye out, um, and yeah. And group has an E on the end, if you search for us. So yes. it's HPA group with an E. 
um, because we're just so French, can't we tell? <laughs> um, and the, the other thing that I I think is just worth briefly mentioning, um, and it's something that's come up in a in a couple of conferences that I've been to recently, is this idea of mentorship. And I I think it sounds like a kind of a big scary word that maybe you wouldn't get involved with, but actually, um, people are quite easily flattered. So get yourselves on LinkedIn, um, and and speak to people who have um the kind of jobs that you think you might like and I bet nine times out of ten people would be so flattered that you've got in touch and said you know your job looks really interesting or what you do looks really interesting and I would love to find out more and um, ask them and I'm I'm sure that they would be willing to help certainly everybody in our business I know would would respond to you and um, by making those you know starting those conversations You've got nothing to lose just asking a question so by starting those conversations you don't know what could come out of it so um we just had somebody on work experience two weeks ago who got in touch with muriel who is our uh, quality and compliance director and they ended up doing a two-week work experience placement as a result of that so um yeah you know just just ask questions be inquisitive and um it, it will pay off would be my my advice uh, is there any other questions and was that useful or were there any questions that we answered and you thought actually you didn't answer that question at all and you need us to have another go at it or <laughs> take that as a no <laughs> i don't think there's anything else coming through from from the chat um there liz but um if i can just round off um i mean it, it, it i think i think it's the main message is that um just that huge array of opportunities that are, is behind a name um, you know the the raising awareness today of the different sectors the different opportunities um, you know you you, you think group and brioche full stop don't you you don't ever really think of the layers about how that brioche bones actually got out onto the shelf so hopefully and um, the students who are listening or will pick up um, on the video and recording afterwards um, will just you know be uh, I don't know, think, think through that raising curiosity, um, that ability to ask questions and actually start to think behind um, the big picture to get into the layers that um, are behind their, their everyday experiences. Um, thank you so much. I think the, 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 you know, the value points are very much about taking those opportunities that are given to you, have a go, uh, reach out to people to, to make that first step. Um, and don't ever think that maybe you haven't got that experience because, um, as we've said, you know, um, your, your childhood experiences, those experiences you've had through, um, you know, your, your summer holiday jobs all add up to you as a person. And that might be exactly what the, the um, you know, the, the role it needs um, and makes you stand out. So thank you so much indeed. Um, if it's OK with everyone at San Pierre Group, if we do have any other questions that come in from our students. we'll get those answers back to you as soon as possible and i'm very sure that um we can get hold of our colleagues here if there's anything you know sort of specific around the various sectors that they've talked about whether that's marketing or the commercial side sales and so on so once again thank you so much um don't forget the recording of this can be seen on our website in the student zone um, and it will be sent out as well to anyone who's registered for the call today so thank you very much indeed Thanks. thank you thank you, thank you. <laughs>